Greetings from my home in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Let me first thank the team that is giving us an opportunity to literally connect as we share some music. My thanks to the Virtual Piano Festival and Corvallis Piano International. Furthermore, if there is a person who is a force with all she has done for the piano scene in Corvallis, it is Rachel McCabe. I am most thankful for her for all the visit I had in Corvallis and visiting you now through the Virtual Piano Festival. Thank you, and it is a pleasure being here. Lastly, before the music starts, I just want to wish a very good and happy new year. A year that will give us a new start after the very difficult one we just lived. My warmest feelings to all. I have for you eight preludes from Debussy's two volumes of preludes. These preludes, written between 1909 and 1913, present us to, in some ways, world music. It is done using many influences and yet always sounding like Debussy. We have to remember that the world came to him in Paris with the two world fairs of 1889 and 1900. As Garcia Lorca pointed out in a talk on Conte Hondo, Debussy was a hungry young composer who was looking for the new, and these world exhibits provided him with an unprecedented musical treasure chest. Of course, there are many other sources feeding Debussy's imagination. We can think of ancient civilizations, legends, fairy tales, literature, poetry, visual arts, comedians, nature, etc. Before each piece, I will give a very little introduction, which I hope will put these works in context. Lastly, in the printed music, there are no titles at the beginning of each prelude. The title of each prelude appears at the end of each piece, in parentheses. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. I will simply add that I do not feel he wanted to limit his listener's imagination with a title. An afterthought was enough for him. The listening experience then becomes personal and the music speaks for itself. It is in some ways idealistic, but truly imaginative. Unfortunately, spoiler alert, I will give you the title in my introduction to each prelude as well as a few possible suggestions regarding the content. All you need to do is fill in the blanks with your own imagination and listening experience. At the conclusion of the piece, a little slide will appear with the title. I hope you will not mind this little twist, the title after the piece. Here are the eight preludes I have for you. Danseuse de Delphes, voile, les sons et les parfums tournent dans l'air du soir, la cathédrale engloutie. From the second volume of the preludes, I will share La Puerta de Vigna, Bruyère, General la ville excentrique, and Ondi. Danseuse de Delphes. The temple of Delphi was dedicated to Apollo, god of music, poetry, and prophecy. It was famous for its oracle, the Pytha. Pythia sat on a three-legged footstool over a fissure from which emanated vapors from the decomposed body of the earth dragon Pytha that Apollo killed. From these vapors, she entered a trance and she predicted the future, things to come. 
It is the first of his 24 preludes and quite appropriate as prelude to things to come. Voile, sails, veils. Most people believe that the popular American dancer Louise Fuller, who performed in the early 20th century in Paris, inspired this prelude. It also could represent sails. What is for sure? The invisible is moving the visible, or the invisible is catching the visible. The air or the wind is creating moving musical phrases. Fuller developed her dancing technique, choreographed and designed her own clothes, particularly very long silk skirts that could reflect light. The work also has two scales providing the coloristic effect, whole tone scale and pentatonic, nothing else.
Les sons et les parfums tournent dans l'air du soir. The sounds and fragrances swirl through the evening air. This title is a line from Harmonie du soir by Charles Baudelaire. A line very similar to another poem title, Correspondance, also from Les Fleurs du Mal by Baudelaire. The line from Correspondance is Les parfums, les couleurs et les sons se répondent. Perfumes, sounds and colors correspond. Although we could speak about this masterpiece for hours, I will point out a few things. Harmonie du soir, where we find the title of this prelude, is a pantoum. Harmonie du soir is composed of a series of quatrains. The second and fourth lines of each stanza are repeated as the first and third lines of the next. This pattern continues for any number of stanzas, except for the final one, which differs in the repeating pattern. This overall scheme is a pantoum. In this prelude, we also hear two prominent intervals, the tritone and perfect fourth ending phrase. Could this slightly relate to Baudelaire's only two rhymes that he used in Harmonie du Soir? In addition, the recurrence of certain sounds or musical phrases might correspond to certain lines in the poem. In addition, new material is always followed by a familiar musical phrase, as in the pantoum form, again, another possible correspondence. In my humble opinion, there are two musical phrases that could relate to two lines of the poem. First, le soleil s'est noyé dans mon sang qui se fige. The sun has drowned in its congealing blood. Second, the last line of the poem reads, Ton souvenir en moi luit comme un instant soir. In me, your memory shines like a silver Eucharist thread. This concluding line in the poem is, of course, never repeated, never to be heard again. Our piece ends in a miraculous, distant melody.
la cathédrale engloutie. The sunken cathedral. This prelude might take from the story of an old Breton legend, which is the French counterpart to the biblical sonnet. In Is, the name of a submerged Brittany city, which also could relate to Mont Saint Michel in Brittany, this city was engulfed by the sea because of the sinning inhabitants. The city had been built by a king for his daughter. The city was below sea level. There were gates protecting the city from the sea, and one lock with a key could open the gates. The king kept it for himself. The daughter had a grand time partying every night. One lover a night, and then he was disposed of in the sea. Eventually, a prince sent by God put an end to this. He somehow opened the gates, and the city was submerged. The daughter apparently became a mermaid. She now sings to attract fishermen, and then kill them. A real little Odile. Here and there, when the weather is quiet, we can hear bells from the city. The city of Paris also takes its name from East, Paris. Some of Debussy's most favorite elements are present in this prelude. Pentatonic introduction, bells, gamelan, layer.
la puerta de vino. This work takes its inspiration from the Alhambra, a 13th century Moorish palace close to Granada in southern Spain. At least one other piece is related to this setting, Soiree dans Grenade from Estop. Influences, flamenco, very passionate wild song and dance with guitar accompaniment. And as with so much music from the Andalusia, there is a Moorish or Northern African influence. Habanera, from Cuba, with also Northern African influence. The music has explosive contrast. Here are a few. Light, dark, love, hatred, male, female, violence, passionate sweetness. Debussy simply indicated that it should be played with the opposing of extreme of violence and extreme sweetness. Another descriptive word that he used is âpre, meaning rough, unpleasant, bitter. There could be many definitions that could refer to Bruyere, either briar wood and heath as a type of landscape. Some scholars have pointed out that it has a very pastoral and melodic quality from Breton or Celtic folk. Debussy uses some gestures reminiscent of the prelude from his sweet Bergamasque with its flowing and almost improvisatory descending line. There is a kindness and gentleness, 
In the middle section, Debussy asks the performers for a brisker tempo and more agitation while keeping the dynamics soft. In some fashion, one can only imagine an inner joy that is too precious to overtly. General Lavigne eccentric. In 1910, the American comedian clown Edward Lavigne, also known as General Lavigne, was featured at the Theatre Marigny in Paris. Quite an act. In it, Mr. Lavigne stated that he spent his life as a soldier. He made impersonations of wooden puppet, tightrope walking, dueled with himself, played the piano with his toes, etc. There even is an article somewhere mentioning that Debussy was asked to write incidental music for this act. True, maybe or maybe not, but nevertheless, Debussy saw the act. Of course, it is reminiscent of minstrels. It also ends as irreverently as Garlingwalk's Cakewalk and quotes. The Campton Racer song Stride Bass is, of course, also present. Thank you. 
For the French, Odin was a creature brought up on the water and who appeared on land as a beautiful, capricious child woman. This description also fits very well many drawings of Odin by Rackham. In addition, Debussy adored the Little Mermaid, not the Disney version, of course, uh, the Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. In this story, Odin has the upper body of a woman and a fish tail in lieu of legs. She is also caught between two worlds. We also know of the seductress, magnificent Odin by Fadel. One very important characteristic of mermaids is that they live in undisturbed, playful happiness. They know that they have no soul. They can gain a soul only if they acquire the love of a man. If they do, they lose their previous and carefree state. Is it worth it? For Debussy's Odin, we have more of a childlike quality. Still, Odin is a dancer, coy, coquettish, inviting, mysterious, lyrical, troubled, and troubled. Thank you. 